What is up, Homebrewed Christianity listeners? This podcast, this episode today, if you are like saying to yourself, what does contemporary constructive theology look like for Christians? Then this might be one of the best episodes you've ever heard because on the podcast is Stephen Ray Jr. He is a theology professor at Garrett Evangelical Theological Society. He is the uh, president of the Society for the Study of Black Religion. He's the author of Do No Harm, Social Sin, Christian Responsibility, and Black Church Studies and Introduction. But he is also the editor with Laurel Schneider, who's been on the podcast, to this new book, Awake to the Moment, An Introduction to Theology, which is the product of the, the work group on constructive theology. So I, I, it is hard to say in advance just how wonderfully theological this is about to get. Oh, you're listening to Homebrew Christianity Podcast. By the way, if you were asleep, then you should awake to the moment. Ooh, yeah, 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 yeah. So this podcast is about a book. It came out. It is an introduction to theology book that is the the product of an extended process of a whole bunch of different theologians. There's tons of them, but I, I thought I would just name ones that have been on the podcast before. Sounds so that you idea. have an idea. So Stephen Ray, who you're about to hear, but um, co-edited it with Laurel Schneider. Who was on the podcast? She teaches at uh, Vanderbilt. Um, she was on the podcast talking about her book Beyond Monotheism: A Theology of Multiplicity. When we did that series, I don't know how long ago, on um, polydoxy and stuff. Mm. Uh, Jorg Rieger is in the group that helped uh, put it together. Mary McClintock Fulkerson from Duke. Um, uh, Darby Kathleen Ray. Um, Don Schweitzer is in it. Uh, James Evans. Uh, so, the um, who, oh Cynthia Rigby mm. is in it. John Tatominal, Marion Growl, Wendy Farley, like these are all people that help put this together. And you may sing to yourself, that is one extremely diverse voices of theology. Like w- w- how they do it, you're going to hear that story. What did they gain? Tons of things. Not one person from a particular tradition, school of thought, or whatever could do. And um, yeah, so you're going to hear this, and then you're going to say. I'm going to go read that book. And if you are teaching an intro to theology class in the near future, you're going to say, I want to teach that book because yeah, it's it's just a wonderful, wonderful conversation. And it was, it was a true blast to get to talk to uh, Dr. Ray. Never had him on the podcast before. Uh, But when you get done hearing this, you're going to say, uh, bring him back, please. Now I I want to hear him just rock at his own, in his own voice, not, you know, trying to share from the whole group. That's a great. You know, I was just thinking something about what you just said made me think we should have like a, like an award ceremony or something at the end of every year where listeners get to vote on who their favorite author, philosopher, theologian, whatever is, and then we bring them back you know, like for a special oh. special episode or something like that. I would see that is what that's that's a type of planning <laughs> that um, yeah. So it, uh, okay, if so, if stuff like that sounds exciting, then clearly, th- then we just need more members to the homebrew community. Yeah, group that's why you should be a homebrew community. because, um, like, I don't have I don't have any extra time. <laughs> 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 like doing multiple podcasts every week uh, and and everything that goes along with it, I'm, I'm kind of maxed out, and I haven't even had my third kid yet. There, he, he's on the way. Although by the time you're hearing this, he's oh, probably I'll probably have a new one. Yeah. You should go check my Instagram. It's gonna be cute baby pictures. Oh yeah, and but see that's one of the perks of being a homebrew community member is you get to put you know have, have input in into those sorts of things. Yeah, so and and maybe maybe it's like the members select their favorites and vote and stuff, and uh, in because what theologian has like unannounced got a really cool trophy mailed to them? Now that sounds fun. See? We mail them trophies and they're like, "Can you send us a selfie with your with your theology nerd trophy?" See, this is where the magic happens. Right oh here. yeah. Look, this is a good idea. So anyway, if you want to um, uh, be a part of putting together <laughs> the, the, the Theology Awards for this 2017, <laughs> uh, then go to homebrewcommunity.com and you can join. You can get yourself an ecclesiastical title, donating each month, supporting the podcast, be a part of the secret Facebook group, give input to everything. You'll get access to all the past homebrewed Christianity classes, epic read groups, um, theology nerd boot camps. There's a new one that's going to be added. So if you're like a youth minister, I just did a big theology nerd boot camp at Progressive Youth Ministry. And if you remember, you'll be able to download it where you get, um, 
I do I do a, a, a one and a half hour lecture that introduces um, Charles Taylor for youth ministers, and then I do one that introduces Heidegger for youth ministers, and then we discuss how to do uh, confirmation. Um, uh, if Heidegger and Charles Taylor were helping us think through things, and there's a little aside to Peter Berger because I was getting ready for reading <laughs> Peter Berger at the Hatchery. Um, so yeah, yeah. So those are things like plus you get uh, you know the first dibs on cool things like tickets to theology beer camp. Oh yes, yeah, true. You do. Um, and, and if you're if you are like saying to yourself this August, I'm anticipating the need to take to take the universe up on that offer for zestiness then 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 that uh that invitation might be at theologybeerkit.com <laughs> um in in august on the 18th and 19th of august we're going to be in denver uh, nathaniel and i and and peter rollins are going we're going to be doing theology beer camp there we already have we already have um 20 camp counselors that are helping us put together a wonderful uh nerdy Packed full of fun and uh, excitement uh, experience right there in Denver on the 18th and 19th. Then the following weekend, we're going to Oklahoma City. 25th, 26th. Mm-hmm. And, and let me tell you, in Oklahoma City, you're saying to yourself, how in the world can you have a beer camp in Oklahoma? Do they even have craft beer? I mean, obviously Denver. But yes, yes, my friends, they do. Oh, they do. Um, yours truly is, is member 32 at American Solera which is uh, the second best new brewery in the world, first best in the United States this past year. Um, and and we have a chaplain of fermentation in Oklahoma City who... Will not disappoint. ...is a legend in the homebrew... This is the godfather of homebrewed Christianity. Like, that is a title that you don't purchase. It is it is given to you. It is bestowed. Yeah. Like, from on high. When, whatever the, um, the, the position of doing infallible things on behalf of homebrew is uh, basically when really cool stuff happens multiple times then you like give people titles just as, as signs of s- slightly sarcastic affirmation and and Charlie brewed my homebrew recipes and brought them to multiple live podcasts in the area like he took them to both subverting the norm conferences we did live podcasts mm-hmm. at so he made like the Caputo beer the Keller beer the Cobb beer took them there um, he did it, uh, organized stuff for my book tour and things. And, um, he, and when I'm ever, I'm out doing podcasts every year in Oklahoma, he's like, we should also have just a gathering of the homebrewed community members, bottle share night. And, uh, and so like the Godfather is going to be there. So that I mean, alone is yeah. just, because normally you would say Denver, Denver should have to handicap themselves mm. to compete with Oklahoma on mm-hmm. the craft beer thing. Cause Denver's like really the only city that's not on a coast that people think of craft beer for. But no, no, no. I'm saying we're not giving a handicap uh, to Oklahoma because they got the Godfather. That's right. Yeah. I'm and, really looking forward to that. And So go to theologybeercamp.com. And, and also, you, you're just excited that you know at least Solero will provide sour, sour, beer, sour, sour cause, beers. That's right. Because you're... <laughs> I do love some sour beers. Oh, yeah. So Theology Beer Camp. And... You know, if you're a member of the homebrew community, you can uh, have, have, have personal beer palate advice from the Godfather. And uh, the, I found out that uh, one of the members asked Charlie for beer advice for a Christmas gift. Mm-hmm. So well, he he likes this and this and this. Gave the wisdom, impressed people at a Christmas party. So wow. the things the community provides <laughs> is high. Yeah. Just... <laughs> um, the last thing I was going to say is uh, is is thank you. To everyone that was at Progressive Youth Ministry. I went out to Progressive Youth Ministry. It was in North Carolina this year. Um, Nathan, I know you had a... Oh, wait. You didn't come this time? Shut up. Um, but uh, we had one of the coolest groups for the Theology Nerd Boot Camp. Uh, and then the live podcast, which you'll all hear in the near future, was like a, a blind date set up by Jack Caputo. <laughs> Jack Caputo says, Trip... You need to meet Aaron Simmons, who is uh, a phenomenologist, uh, a philosophy professor. Um, and he told Aaron, he's like, you need to meet Trip. Y'all are going to get along. Apparently, uh, we're in a category of like, uh, in like in intellectuals he respects that are surprisingly way too confessional or, or some sort. 
And and so Aaron's like, hey, I know you're coming out this way. I can drive up. And I said, no, you have to come be on the podcast. And then before it, I'm like, stop talking about that. We have to talk about it when we're on the podcast. <laughs> and it, 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 went, it went amazing. He explains all the phenomenological reductions in the uh, podcast. So um, along with uh, Lauren Winters on the, that episode, uh, anyway, it's, it's great. But I just want to give a shout out to everyone that was there. Um, and especially, especially like even Tier Hardy mm-hmm. from Crackers and Grape Juice, despite the fact I realized that it, he stole a whole bunch of cigars from our theology beer camp here that just ended up in his bag and he brought them to PYM. And at least he, he confessed and gave one of my cigars back to me. Um, <laughs> but I don't know. He, I think, may have had the most gusto during um, group karaoke mm. at the end of the podcast. Mm-hmm. And, and I was not expecting it. Halfway through, when I realized the level he was given, I had to raise, I had to raise my game. Wow! And you know, I just, I just, this is my shout out to Tier uh, for doing that. Um, That's what happens when your heart gets strangely warmed. Yeah. So it was a strong aside right there, Nathan. I thought we were <laughs> wrapping up, but uh, now here you go. I, I'm ready to be awake to the moment. I, that's what I'm ready for. All right, ladies and gentlemen, theologians of all proclivities. You may as well open up your imagination. Because Dr. Stephen Ray is about to bring the constructive Christian theological nugget of inspiration that you didn't even know you needed. I felt like that was like a movie trailer. That's right, pretty good. Go. Hello, homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Trip. And uh, today on the podcast, we are going to be talking about a brand new book, which if you're going to be taking systematic theology in the near future, you'll probably find it on your syllabus. It's called Awake to the Moment, an Introduction to Theology. And this comes out of the work, the working group of constructive theology. Um, and we're here with one of the editors, Stephen Ray Jr., who is a professor at Garrett um, Evangelical uh, Theological Seminary. And uh, we're, we're we're ready we're ready to hear about uh, uh, the group, the book, and uh, some of the ways uh, that your collaborative work has uh, thought to reintroduce constructive theological thinking today. So, thanks so much for joining. Thank you. It's good to uh, be with you. Looking forward to the conversation. So, um, as a as a part of a, a constructive theology group that has a long a long history over forty years. Um, what is it like to have a group where people, people's research and teaching areas are as specific as constructive theology? Well, I mean, one of the things about our work is that um, the whole idea of constructive theology is, is a very broad way of thinking about theology. And, and so what that means is that we have uh, many people coming from many different approaches. So there are people whose research, um, I myself consider myself a Reformed theologian. There are also folk who came from um, the vantage point of writing uh, uh, from feminist theology as well as um, uh, from various other sorts of progressive uh, theological standpoints. So, so what it is is that we converge on one thing, and the one thing that we all converged on was the belief that the Christian faith still has something meaningful to say to our society today um, that moves beyond the sort of um, uh, conservative voices that we hear in the public sphere. So even though we come at it from different sorts of approaches, we have some very similar commitments, uh, the commitments to um, our society and commitments to the least of these among us. And uh, for people that regularly listen to the homebrew, I just thought I'd let y'all know some of the people that have been on before that are in the group: um, Laurel Schneider and Jorg Rieger, uh, Cindy Rigby, John Tatominal, Marion Grau, uh, Kathleen Darby Ray, uh, Mary McClintock Fulkerson. Um, they're they're all a part of the group. Uh, James Evans um, contributed to it, and and he's been on the podcast. So uh, you know, what you're hearing is is about a book that has. That all those different voices and more uh, contributing to it, and um, I wonder if you could describe what what the methodological shifts you've observed in the constructive theology working group um, uh, kind of uh, o- over the years. Well, 
Well, I think, uh, you know, to step backwards, um, let me say that the first thing uh, is that uh, uh, the group that wrote that book, virtually all of us, when we did the writing, uh, we were senior scholars. So what that meant was that no one needed this book for their career. What we needed to do was to accomplish this work because of our commitments. Um, now, now the reason why I begin there is because the last uh, book that came from the work group, not from individual members in the work group, but from the work group itself, we were all juniors in our career, junior to mid career. So it was important for us to be able to uh, be identified in the work that we did. So if you look at the previous one, you'll find people's names, you'll find little snippets, little essays and that sort of thing. So that was a very different sort of methodology. We went into this thinking that we want this to be a book that as close as possible can have a single voice. So that way we could speak with one voice and introduce a new generation uh, of people to constructive theology. So that was the biggest methodological change, was a commitment to trying to speak in one voice. So when was it that the title became clear? I think it, it Awake to the Moment is not a title that uh, if you were just skimming the bookshelves, you'd go, well, there's an introduction to theology. Um, well, it became clear, I think, once we got the, the final manuscript and uh, Laurel and I were beginning to uh, talk with uh, Westminster John Knox uh, about titles and whatnot. Uh, I, you know, we, because we've been working on this book now for uh, close to five years uh, with a great intensity over the last two years. And one of the things that um, had become clear to us was that we were coming upon a significant historical moment that was almost a paradigm shift. And that part of what we were trying to do was to respond to that. And that's how Awake to the Moment um, came, uh, came to be, because we all had this deep sense that there was something significant going on that was paradigmatically uh, going to be shifting within our society. Mm -hmm. Um, and even the way you phrased it earlier, that that in different ways you all saw Christian theology as having something to say, something uh, to bring into the the conversations uh, that we're having today around uh, that are essential. I wonder if you could describe, especially for those who may go like, well, theologians think there's something to say. What are the reasons or the challenges uh, that, that really make the work of doing constructive theology difficult? What are the things that we need to take seriously to understand uh, the tenuousness of speaking about God? Well, I think that a piece of it is that um, for us, what the urgency is, and, and this is where our sense of contribution uh, comes in, is that one of the ways that um, the Christian faith is being articulated in our uh, particular society, in the public square, is one in which uh, people themselves are not very important. So the what, particularly the well-being of people who are... Um, uh, have diminished opportunities, as well as people who have diminished access to resources and whatnot. And so as a consequence, what ends up happening is that very many of us think that the picture that most uh, people have of Christianity within our context is that it is a small and um, um, a mean thing. And that's not the way we understand our experience um, of God at all, nor is it the way um, uh, any of us have committed our lives to it. So part of the way um, uh, uh, and what informs our work is that when we're approaching the work of doing constructive theology, it is because all of us are profoundly people of faith. And when I say profoundly people of faith, uh, we are people who run that through the prism of some deep social commitments mm -hmm. and some deep sort uh, so so instead of uh, and certainly we all draw from different fields to do our work because virtually all of us uh, do our work in a multidisciplinary um, or an interdisciplinary way but the point is that those are brought to the service of 
articulating a vision of the Christian faith as being life-giving and something that stands in opposition to the powers of death that are so rampant um, within our world and within our society. So when we engage in the work of constructive theology, it's drawing on Christian tradition, trying to pull those pieces, but then also drawing on the best of the social sciences, the best of the historical sciences, uh, the best of cultural studies, as well as the arts and whatnot, but all to the service of articulating this vision of the Christian faith as being a source of life. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do we think about our own locatedness as an individual theologian, like where is it that we theologize from and what type of self-reflections necessary uh, to really kind of own our context and, and location? Well, I think as we identify ourselves, one, um, so I'd answer the question in three ways. One is that we, we have to locate ourselves in some sort of, a tradition that comes out of, of, of um, the broad stream of the Christian faith. Now, what I, what I'm now, and I'm not, I'm not saying you have to do that in a doctrinaire sort of way, but being self-aware about what are the things that motivate you, mm-hmm. what are the things that shape how you view the world. As I said earlier, uh, a bit earlier, um, I'm a Reformed theologian. So what that means is that um, I have deep suspicions. Uh, about humans and human institutions. And so as a consequence, what it means then is that as I'm doing my work as a constructive theologian, not to allow my deep suspicions to overwhelm a wellspring of hope for the possibilities of uh, Christianity. So, I mean, that's one way of talking about situatedness. Another way of talking about our situatedness is simply the sort of embodiment that we have that moves through the world. So, for instance, it makes a difference that I'm a middle-aged black man in America who has had to deal with um, institutional racism for more than 50 years and has had to deal with the sort of realities that it unfolds. That shapes how I think about things. It shapes how I talk about things. It shapes how I give legitimacy um, to the faith. And so that's, so that, so that's clearly one of the ways our particular embodiment. So it makes a difference whether or not you're a man moving through the world or a woman. It makes a difference whether you are a brown person or not. You know, and being aware to the differences, because more often than not, I think that they actually shape what it is that we believe about the possibilities mm-hmm. for the Christian faith in our society. Um, and so it's good to be aware of those. And the final thing, I think, is that it, it, it's important to recognize our social locatedness in terms of geography and class, because I think that there is a very real and significant way that um, uh, the spaces in which we grow up in, uh, in terms of geography, also shapes the way we understand the world and how it is that we understand uh, the well-being of the world. And, uh, you know, th- that shot through with assumptions about class, et cetera. But those are the three things that I think we have to be critically self-reflective of, because as we are articulating a Christian vision, those are the things that are shaping whatever vision we have uh, that we're trying to articulate. Mm-hmm. No, I, that's extremely helpful. And uh, one of the elements I thought that was uh, th- that really ran throughout the entire book is a, uh, a, a nuanced delineation about the relationship of skepticism and belief and um, that skepticism wasn't something that you conquered at the beginning and then go, oh, now I'm going to go do good theology. And belief wasn't something that ever got fully settled. Uh, and yet the skepticism and belief, that tension was uh, a positive dynamic for doing constructive theology. Yes, yes. And I mean, I think that, you know, in that way, um, you, you know, in an ironic sort of way, that's where even um, uh, the least doctrinaire among us um, demonstrates the way in which uh, streams within uh, Western Christianity have shaped us profoundly. So, so for us, skepticism and belief um, uh, uh, are not overcome by a force of will. 
right? But rather they, but rather they are simply settled with that this is what it means to be human with finite understanding um, in a world uh, who, whose uh, very finitude creates the condition for unnecessary suffering, creates the condition for the flourishing of evil and all these other things um, that lead us to questions. You know, so for all of us, um, uh, for some of us, it's easier to, to identify where that comes from. But for all of us, there's a sense that um, trying to proceed as if one deals with uh, uh, the skepticism by a will to believe is beside the point entirely and is actually quite mistaken. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things in trying to capture that dynamic, especially communicating it to uh, 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 people in theological education, is that being a believing skeptic or a, a skeptical believer it, it today is not just it requires this skepticism towards the inheritance you have in your tradition or a, a, a skepticism that's developed by wrestling with the masters of suspicion a part of that switch from kind of classical liberal progressive theology to one that's been informed by liberation theologies and such is turning that skepticism towards the reigning powers of our day that uh, inscript their truth on our material existence. And, uh, and I think to me, one of the things that was powerful about the way that gets played out in the text is that skepticism and those things are not Ways that we demonstrate to a, a non-religious, post-religious, or a-religious culture that we're smart. Skepticism is then something we do as Christians uh, as part of our prophetic uh, act. Right, right. So, so, I mean, so part of what it is is that the skepticism is not profoundly a skepticism about God, but rather a skepticism about our capacities to fully understand, number one, whatever it is that God is doing in the world. I mean, because part of what it is is that we have certainty about God's inclinations, but in terms of what that means. But then also a deep skepticism that we as people of faith uh, will always be motivated. Uh, by the best of our um, intentions, you know, by the better angels of our nature. So, and, and I think that that's what's, in, uh, what's important in terms of talking about how we were all working with it, is that it's not so much we had a skepticism about God, but rather a skepticism about, one, our capacity to know whatever the heck it is that God is up to in the world but then also a deep skepticism that we ourselves could sort of be morals, uh, pardon me, vessels of a kind of Mm -hmm. uh, moral and righteous superiority. So uh, it's as much a skepticism about us and our knowing um, as it is about our structures and that sort of thing. But, you know, once again, one of the things I want to uh, reiterate is that I think one of the things that, that sort of ran through the group is that uh, there are deep wellsprings of faith. And the deep wellsprings of faith manifest themselves in different ways. But um, So we were skeptics, but not agnostics. If we were agnostics about anything, it would be agnostic about um, uh, the church uh, believing itself to be a force of good ever and always in the world. Well, uh, I think I think any group or any person that uh, has that kind of a, a delusional, blind affirmation of themselves uh, uh, is problematic. And 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 I think even the way you've introduced kind of the contributions uh, out of the reform tradition to that uh, are, are, are can be can be seen the way you're describing it. Um, if, if you're, if you're sitting with all the people in the group, um, what, what do you think some of those unique contributions from the different traditions, uh, are represented are? Like what, what are the ingredients, uh, or, or elements that you put, you can put together as a constructive theologian today, uh, that mm-hmm. maybe we didn't before when traditions didn't work cooperatively, when the diversity of voices in the body of Christ didn't get to speak and testify to their experience and understanding of the faith? Um, well, I, I, I can name uh, three very specifically. One is um, certainly we have a significant number of Roman Catholic 
theologians who have been a part of our work uh, and have been a part of our work now uh, uh, for um, almost 15, 16 years. And certainly they were part of the earlier work, but it's felt much more powerfully now with this recent group. So what that means is a more highly evolved sense of the ideals of tradition and sacramentality. Right. So, I mean, so what that means then is how we thought about tradition, how we thought about sacramentality was enriched by their presence. Um, We also had people um, in the group who came from Anabaptist traditions. So there is a way in which um, I won't say that that counterbalance, but it broadened the sense of how how it is uh, that faith is expressed and experienced um, as a part of a living tradition, but not necessarily part of a storehouse of teachings. Uh, we had people who were part of the Wesleyan traditions. And I mean, they were a wonderful counterbalance to all reformed um, uh, crotchety skeptics such as myself, you know, because of their refreshing belief um, in human possibility. Uh, we also had um, uh, John Tatamino and uh, several other folk who reminded us um, of what it means to have been shaped by a Christianity that was a minority in a largely um, um, uh, Buddhist or um, Islamic uh, context. So that meant that religious plurality, understanding the Christian faith as being situated in a in a context of religious plurality. So I think that you see all of that running throughout the book in ways that perhaps earlier iterations of the book didn't necessarily uh, show those things. So that as we've been constructing then, um, constructive theology, we've been doing it with the idea that one, it's something that is necessarily done in the context of religious plurality but also it's something that's done as an ecumenical enterprise. But, you know, not simply the kind of ecumenical enterprise that, oh, we're trying to find things to agree on, but rather a vibrant living ecumenism so that one could speak in a single voice and hear echoes of the Wesleyan tradition Mm -hmm. and hear echoes of a Roman Catholic tradition, not talking to each other, but actually speaking to the world out of what um, are some of the core commitments that we've uh, understood as being part of the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that um, uh, is, uh, is really exciting about the text itself is because it benefits from all those different traditions uh, having unique contributions and it's in a group of people that gather regularly, are friends, respect each other, read, engage each other. Uh, I, I think there's a, a power in that type of collective voice that you don't always get on, uh, you know, if there's just the same people for one project gathering. Yeah. And it's an ongoing conversation, much like the way in the, in the book you describe uh, doctrines of God coming not just out of, like, you know, perfect revelation into the world, but a doctrine of God is a condensation of what a community says and thinks and believes it knows about God. And, and I wonder if there's uh, elements or things that if you were to think about the constructive theology group together, if there are elements or contributions it makes back to the traditions uh, that they come from uh, that are really gained and collected because you all have vocational commitments to a tradition, the larger tradition, critical reflection, and faith. Well, I think that the biggest contribution is as a witness that we can speak in a um, uh, in a single voice about things of gravity and weight. And so I think that that's the biggest contribution because one of the um, um, challenges, I think, within all generations is that because of the model of ecumenism, of ecumenism um, has been tradition speaking to one another um, uh, and trying to find common ground, that there is actually a significant way that we've demonstrated that it's entirely possible to do that if that's not the point of the conversation, mm-hmm. right? So there's a way that I think that's a significant, so, 
and um, uh, Chip, from my perspective, that's the most significant uh, thing that we've been able to actually witness to and model a kind of organic ecumenism um, that is able to speak to the challenges of the day precisely because we're not trying to figure out who's right or who's wrong, who needs to tell of this belief, who needs to tell of that belief, but rather trying to uh, not so much find a common voice, but rather the commitment to speak life into the world is how we found a common voice. We didn't look for one. What it is is that we found a common project, and that was to speak life into the world. Mm-hmm. Um, this uh, uh, this past week at the, the hatchery, the school where I teach at, um, John Cobb was here, and in a in in a, in his lecture after lecture, he got a question, and uh, you know someone goes in, uh, oh, I'm a Calvinist uh, or coming out of the reform tradition, and starts having a question with him about being a Wesleyan and process about the Eucharist or something like that, and he goes, um, well. I'm not sure it's the theologian's job to uh, stay woke to 16th century debates. And mm-hmm. uh, and then he makes the turn towards, like, let us bring our traditions to the present moment and and what needs to be uh, uh, us ac- across our differences responding together uh, for liberation in life. And, and I remember thinking how many people, especially – early seminarians, right? Those who feel called from their congregations to be stewards of the tradition are usually ones who are totally down to rock the the brand logo uh, of the tradition they came from. They're more, uh, have more awareness of what is kind of the unique features of it. And this text, I can imagine being decentering for a lot of people who love their tradition because it, it's insisting the, our energy is not towards uh, practices that made a world in the past, but these world-making practices and I- investments in the present. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly the case. And I mean, one of the um, uh, thing about the decentering is that because the majority of us had worked on um, a, a previous project and all of us had worked on specific sort of side projects, there was a way in which the de- the decentering had already occurred by the time it came uh, time to actually pull the text together. So that uh, for those in the work group who were um, committed to a particular vision um, um, of the faith and as a consequence uh, wanted to leave that stamp on it, um, uh, we knew each other well enough and had worked together long enough so that if the decentering, as you describe it, became uh, too powerful a force for them to deal with, we gave them room to step back. And so what that meant then was that the collegiality that we had built, um, the sort of trust and respect for one another's faith perspective that we had built allowed people to move in and out with a permeability. And I think that that's what um, was critically important to getting to the point of being able to write the text. And once we came and pulled the text together, uh, the writing teams, as we call them, um, who pulled together the various low side that Laurel and I then uh, co- uh, co-edited, uh, were people who had already worked through that decentering process and were called to actually center the project. And as a consequence, simply be comfortable in that they would bring whoever they were to the project and didn't feel a critical need to tell everybody who they were. So when you're thinking of uh, a traditional systematic theology text, um, some of the biggest differences between those and this one is just even the table of contents, right? Like it doesn't go sources for theology, um, revelation, natural, and special revelation. And and these, it, it's not ordered in the same way. Yeah. And, and, and so I wonder what... Um, were there elements of a, the traditional ordering you thought, well, we, 
because of the way this is being put together, we can't go to those doctrines or those questions? Or was there uh, insights from the group to go, let's structure it this way, um, b- because here's what, where we really think constructive theology today needs to begin and, and how they need to frame uh, our, our thinking? Well, I think part of uh, how um, um, that worked itself out is that virtually all of us, not, now I won't say all, but virtually all of us, were trained as systematic theologians. So for us, it's second nature. And so as a consequence, what that meant was that we didn't feel then that it was necessary to reiterate what's already a part of how we think about the world. So that if you read the text, you'll be able to see that there's virtually not a single doctrine that we don't touch on in some form or some fashion. But the point was we didn't feel the need to just sort of rearticulate that pattern. Because a part of what we thought the challenge was, was to give a clear articulation of constructive theology. And as a bunch of systematic theologians who were doing that, what it meant was it was important to us that all of the doctrines at least be given a nod to. But in terms of um, what uh, constructive theology looks like, our sense is that it's much more driven by what are the needs of the day and not what are the needs of the theological uh, sort of traditions of the 20th century to be rearticulated. One of the challenges I've had um, at teaching either at, at Claremont or here or different places is uh, the distance between kind of professional and vocational theologians and their reflection around theology and constructive theology. And then the questions many of the students ask um, that, uh, that a lot of times students ask the questions that for us, we have a hard time explaining to them why we wouldn't ask the question that way, what was probably implied by the question and how they should ask it differently. And it's easy then for the students to feel like we're being deflationary or belittling of where they are. And, uh, see, I thought an asset of the book is it just doesn't take the, the questions as we were told you're supposed to ask them and then say, and here's what you should really do if you want to have a graduate degree. It, it says, let's look at our world. And if you want to do theology, obviously no one chooses to do theology unless you think God has something to say about the world we're in. So now how do we do it in a, in, with integrity, uh, with the honors diversity that recognizes that if theology doesn't do something to make the world more beautiful and just, then um, maybe we won't put it in this volume. You know, so that decentering of the way theology is organized uh, is to me a sign of uh, is a constructive act while some people in traditions could see it as deconstructive because there's no ch- no chapter labeled what God did in Jesus. Right. Now, you know, and, and I mean, I, I'm glad that you raised that question, Tripp, because um, it's actually our students who were driving the entire book. So what that meant was that at every turn, um, and we were taking – particular notice of students who uh, may have been undergraduate going on to seminary or simply um, upper-level undergraduate or early seminary students or a literate uh, public. But what, what drove all of our work was that our reality check was, are these answering the questions that we have received as teachers in our classroom? Are these dealing with the issues that our students have brought into our classrooms? You know, are these sort of faithfully and honestly articulating something of the faith that has been um, shown a light on by the people who are in our classrooms? So I would say that this book um, is, is probably more student-driven than any project that I've worked on. Well, in, and I think like having the benefit of so many different uh, professors in different parts of the country from different traditions, listening to students uh, it definitely um, it, it makes that an asset. And um, one, of the, one of the things that or, or one of the most powerful elements I thought in the book was how you frame the question of revelation. 
and the role uh, both simultaneous knowing and unknowing plays, the relationship of mystery and humility, but also the, the, the way the positive side of revelation is pitched where knowing some of the p- people that are in the group, uh, it's, it's pitched in a way where we don't have the normal fights we inherited from the 20th century about revelation. Cause you know, like, uh, rehearsing Tillich versus Bart is just entertaining for so long. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, that is, um, um, I probably shouldn't say this, uh, uh, to, um, a national audience, but I'm going to say it anyway, um, is that that's why I'm so happy that there are so many people teaching Bart in the world because I don't have to, you know, because those debates, um, yeah, you know, I mean, for, for a while they're interesting, but then they're so stultifying. And so, yeah, that was, um, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so how would you describe, um, the, the way, uh, uh, or, or how would you, how would you describe the traction? Are language practices and things built out of our traditions? What is the traction point for, for those with God? How would, how would that be understood, um, theologically? Um, say a little bit more about what you mean by attraction. Well, so one of the um, uh, one of the things I found is a lot of constructive theologians um, deal with philosophy of language and those type of issues uh, somewhere, and then they do theology, and it could sound, you know, like orthodoxy. And what they really mean is it's a Wittgensteinian language game. Or they could recognize the the tension between knowledge and power and then want to retake symbols that were used uh, to apply to Jesus in the first century in an anti-imperial context, but rework them because we aren't aware of it. And others will think that the critique of religion, which is also a critique of global capitalism, requires the prophetic no of self-revelation in different ways. And there's so many interesting theological arguments that occur in that epistemology section that then once you start talking about God and what conversation about God means, you miss the uh, prophetic work that was in the methodology. And I thought one of the enjoying parts of the book is it doesn't sit around and do methodology, but it does theology that's invitational, and it, but it was clearly informed uh, by people that recognize contributions to make being made by multiple different um, kind of schools of thought. Right. Well, I think that one of the, um, that's one of the places that our composition, um, really contributed to the shape of the book. And what I mean by our composition is that, uh, because, um, all of us are seasoned theologians, we've come to be self-reflective of all of these multiple discourses that you just identified as being tools that we use. And see, part of what uh, becomes problematic is when you lose sight of it simply being a tool so that it actually overwhelms the sort of theological project that you're trying to be engaged in. That's something that I think, um, I won't say we overcame it, but it's something that we're all critically aware of. And so that made um, um, a significant kind of difference because it meant then that certainly we were deploying all sorts um, of social scientific tools, cultural anthropology, you know, any number of things. Uh, but there was a way that it never overwhelmed the work we were trying to do because we were clear that we were not arguing for a method. We were actually arguing for a commitment to engaging in the theological project with an eye toward speaking life into a world of death and violence, right? So that's what made the difference. So we weren't trying to make methodological points. What we were trying to do was use the uh, methodologies um, that, that are our tools to this larger project. And I think that that's, that, that's a, a big piece of why uh, you read the book in that way. In in um in uh it in the the chapter what do we know and how context and questions the the, the three words that kind of stuck out to me about uh about this the really constructive tension is where you point out that all revelation requires interpretation uh, all revelation it comes from God's own initiative um, and it must be dealt with in community with integrity 
and that that interplay of interpretation, divine initiative, and integrity in the material existence of the community is a dynamism where to forsake one of the three problematizes theology. Like a theology that just discusses our interpretation and God's initiative means that theology isn't about transformation of the world. Uh, to, to get out uh, God's initiative, then it becomes sociology and with Jesus poetry. Or if you get rid of interpretation and it's about the world and God's initiative, then you get some totalitarian conclusions where God is ready to legislate everything for everybody. And having all three uh, present means to do theology well, you have to uh, do it constructively. And um, in, in fidelity isn't just repetition of the past. Uh, it's something you do in the world and in community. Mm-hmm. Now, now, what you picked up on, I thought it was very good because to the sensitive of ear, what you saw was that we were engaging in theology rooted in the great commandment without ever having to say so. Well, the, the odd part is that Christian theologians have the possibility of engaging in theology without thinking about the great commandment. Um, and uh, if if, uh, if if there is something where different parts of the Christian tradition can come together and then speak back to its tribe and go, please stop doing that, um, I, I think that's a, a great contribution of the uh, of the book itself. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, one of the, uh, before we move on from that point, I think that one of the things that we have as a commitment, um, and had as a commitment is that often there is this, um, artificial, um, uh, debate that goes on as to whether or not theology takes scripture seriously or whether or not if you take scripture seriously, you can do good theology. And so part of what we're trying to do is just drop those little uh, breadcrumbs along the way, if you will, because just as the way you described it, right, is that it's just love of God and love of neighbor and, you know, the challenge of constructing what those mean in one's world. Um, And that's sort of the three poles there so that people could see very clearly and, and feel the deep structures of the Christian faith, but being articulated in such a way um, that tried to sort of bring down that, um, uh, what most of us viewed as sort of a false dichotomy of either doing theology as a philosophical project or being sensitive to scripture. Mm-hmm. So um, in the book, uh, when you uh, there are a couple different places that touch on uh, images for ecclesiology. And in it, you talk about uh, communities of celebration and communities of learning. Uh, I, I wonder if you could uh, spell that out, because knowing how um, I don't know, historically defined our understandings of ecclesiology are, depending on the tradition we came, I thought uh, that, that that was... Um, uh, that the communities of celebration and learning has to have a story to it, that how those are the elements that end up uh, uh, rising to the fore. Well, I mean, that's our way of talking about sacramentality, right? I mean, the whole idea of um, uh, celebration um, as well as um, um, as well as preaching. Right. So, I mean, because there's a way that that's then how we talk about word and sacrament and how we talk about it in terms of being the two major sort of ways um, of framing it with um, sacrament being understood broadly, you know, sort of a Eucharistic way. So when so when you talk, when you bring those two together and once you sit with them for a moment, that's when you begin to see the dynamism that's going on between um, the liturgical traditions, like uh, liturgical slash sacramental traditions like Roman Catholic, um, Anglican and um, well, I said Episcopals, we don't have Anglicans, we have Episcopalians and um, uh, some of the Wesleyan traditions and people who come out of the Reformed traditions and, and Anabaptist traditions. So that's very clearly where you see us trying to deal with the dynamism, you know, of saying, well, no, you don't have to make a choice, that there really is a way that we can speak fully out of our own traditions in a way that creates a, a vibrant understanding of the broad Christian tradition as such. Mm-hmm. 
So uh, tell me, tell me about zombies and how zombies got in the book. And um, I mean, you don't have to name names of your uh, of of other theological peers that are engaged in uh, flesh eating theology. But um, I, you know, it, it, when you got to that point, I thought to myself, somebody was lecturing in class, and a student said, "Well, it's kind of like a zombie." And then you you get together, and people are like, "This is the greatest image. I tried it in my class too, and it worked." Um, well, to be honest with you, that goes back to that point of bringing what we heard in our classrooms. Now, I will admit that um, the, uh, the numbers of us who taught in undergraduate institutions um, were much more immersed in uh, the sort of zombie um, uh, culture that's emerging, but even some of us who were teaching in seminars. So that, you know, honestly, Trip, that wasn't something that we tried out. That was something that when it was brought up that, well, you know, I heard this in my class that there was a, a, a fairly broad agreement. Well, you know, it came up in my class as well. So there's a way that, um, the way in which that has permeated our culture. Um, particularly demonstrates um, uh, how it is that, um, because, you know, we're all teaching religion. You know, a few of us um, are teaching other sorts of things, but the majority of us are teaching religion in some form or fashion. So somehow, you know, this has become a sense-making tool for an entire generation of people. And so that's why we put it in the book, because we could not find any sort of image um, that had been as widely attested to uh, within our classrooms as a sense-making uh, um, idea for the current world in which we live as zombies. So that, that's how it um, that, that, that's how it sort of came to be. So so share share just a bit about uh, a kind of uh, uh, what you see going on in that cultural fascination, and then uh, what is it calling forth from constructive theologians? Well, I think that part of what um, is uh, 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 in that is a recognition that in our contemporary world, um, there are at least two generations of people who are experiencing the power of death quite powerfully in terms of the dissolution of the world in which they live. So as a consequence, being alive, and because the whole point of being a zombie is that you're actually dead, but you're still alive. So you, you're living under the power of death. You just happen to be alive when you're living under it. So I think that, you know, and, and, and from my perspective, that is precisely what is behind the Christian faith, right? Having a word to speak into those who are feeling the power of death very powerfully. So I think that that um, also was another reason why that image struck us so powerfully, because particularly when you look at Paul talk about the dominion of death um, and the power of death. I mean, what better image? So for my generation, it's not the zombies, right? It was vampires, right? I mean, so Count Dracula was the one who was uh, sort of exemplified uh, this power of death that actually masqueraded his life among us. But, um, um, yeah, the zombies, I think, that the, and the Christian message is geared directly toward that. Well, and, you know, as as, as someone in the Reformed tradition, I, you were probably excited to find out that of all the all all the monsters and villains that, that come up, uh, zombies uh, are the only monster that, uh, especially in The Walking Dead, that, that that whatever whatever the source of it is, it in every zombie apocalypse story, it comes from human hubris, right? Like we're messing with DNA, environmental crisis, some science thing. Yep. The yep. Zombies emerge out of human hubris, and then you discover post-apocalypse that you don't have to get bit. You're walking dead. You're already dead, and um, and the recognition of that is uh um it, it's like reading romans with uh john calvin i'm guessing yes. that's so yes it is <laughs> the uh, uh so so maybe i thought uh, it would be it would be uh, good just to uh, let people learn a little bit more about your work outside the context of just this book um because you've spent some time working both uh i know you wrote uh, do no harm uh, which is uh, social sin and Christian responsibility. Um, you you help put together the the introduction to Black Church Studies, 
uh, and you, you teach at, um, Garrett Evangelical uh, Theological Seminary. And, um, so I can, can you describe, uh, what it was that brought you out of your, your life in the church to being called, uh, and, and, and serving as a, as a theology professor? Uh, yeah, I can tell you exactly what it was. I was sitting in systematic theology and David Kelsey was lecturing. This would have been in 1991. Um, and he was talking about the church. And I found myself weeping at the end of class and because the evocation and, and it was then that I saw the beauty of theology. And so part of what it was, was that that's what began my love affair um, uh, with the doing of theology, because that was when I had experienced it as something that was not simply a noetic enterprise, but something that could be done um, in a way that was quite beautiful. So, um, and I worked very closely with Serene Jones um, as well. She actually ended up uh, being my uh, dissertation director, and for that um, I'm eternally grateful. But that's where my love affair began. So for the first, um, I'd say probably 15 years, um, I, I, I didn't make a choice because I was teaching and pastoring at the same time. Um, and then, um, cause, uh, uh, when I left my last pastorate, um, which would have been back in 2005. So that was about 12 years ago. Now that was when I, I you know, I've only been teaching, but it's always been with an eye to how is it that my teaching is actually helping shape and prepare people so that they might then create um, the church, what that is uh, um, uh, going to be what carries us into the future. So there's a way that um, uh, being a theologian um, um, uh, is my sense of calling and vocation, but it is with a, de- a very deep sense that my primary accountability is to the faithful witness of the church in the world. And when I say faithful, I don't mean faithful in terms of faithful to our traditions, but rather faithful to the articulation of life into the world um, and helping to equip and prepare those who are excited to engage in that work. Mm-hmm. Um, what What are some of the kind of, connection points that uh you've you've made in your work between the reform tradition and the the american black church experience that uh that that you know that function for for theological reflection because i know um when uh james evans was on the podcast uh one of the things he did such i i thought does such a good job is insisting that theologians deal with the doctrines and the actual lived experience of people in congregations of faith and that a temptation for a lot of theologians is is to either abstract the experience of the laity into some generic human being in a generic place that you're standing up for, or essentialize the laity into your own experience, um, and then you miss the richness of the tradition and the materiality and and, and situatedness of of the diverse bodies of the church. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think that that's where uh, one of my critical principles is that um, I don't talk about um, experience, right? So, you know, you think about the uh, tripod scripture tradition experience or, you know, quadrilateral, now that I'm teaching at a, a Methodist school, I think about the witness of the saints, right? So I really talk about, in my own work, I really talk about experience, because that makes it seem as if there is a human experience. A part of being um, um, uh, uh, a black person of my age in America is that I know that the only people who are interested in deploying a normative account of what human experience is are people who will likely ignore my experience and the experience of the communities would shape me. So as a consequence, what I do is I talk about it in terms of the witness of the saints. So that as a consequence, then, a significant part of my theological methodology is to read as broadly as I can, to be as attentive as I can to engage in um, the consumption of as much uh, cultural production as I can so that I can actually hear what people are saying 
about how they are experiencing their humanity. So, um, and, and I think that a big piece of, uh, how, the, of how that then informs um, how I bring together um, my identity as um, a Reformed theologian who's speaking um, uh, uh, in multiple idioms, but a dominant idiom uh, being the Black church tradition is that when I talk about the witness of the saints, that's very deeply connected to the tradition in the Black church of testify. Mm-hmm. Like testifying what God has done in your life, testifying about God's presence in your life. So then what that means is actually listening to the testimony and not simply trying to immediately capture, well, what did they really mean? You know, or how do we translate that? So instead of engaging in those two projects, simply listen to people. And I think that there is a real and significant way um, that um, out of the stream of the reform tradition that I come from, uh, which is a congregational stream, I mean that I mean that's just a central part of who and what we are is the recognition of the uh, not simply autonomy, but the validity of individual congregations and individual human beings as sites of um, uh, conscious engagement uh, with God and God's power. So that's why I bring the two together. Right? Mm-hmm. So what do you think the, uh, the theologians proper response is today uh, when so many uh, of us have been shocked about uh, the election, um, the responses to it, um, what what kind of listening to cultural production uh, do you think is, is necessary? Well, I think the one, and for me, this becomes critically important, right, is that um, uh, Calvin reminds us that the human heart is a factory. He calls it a manufactory, but a factory of idols. And I think one of the things we've not been attentive enough to because it's been given expression in such a ubiquitous fashion, is we have not been attentive to how a sort of mythology of American exceptionalism shot through the lens of race has become broadly um, sort of the seedbed of so much of American Christianity. So as a consequence, what that means is that when you have a candidate that says, I'm going to make America great again, at the exact same time that the candidate is deploying xenophobic uh, white nationalist rhetoric, that these two are not seemingly contradictory, demonstrates to us you know, how deep these structures are. So I think that in terms of listening to them, what that means is that as theologians, what our challenge is, is how do we articulate a faith so that these deep structures that are intertwined such that they were able to produce this um, can not only be exposed, but actually something can be countered. What we need now, Tripp, is we need a construction of the Christian faith in which those two things don't make any sense together at all. So if someone says, make America great again, and then engages in xenophobic white nationalist rhetoric, those things won't make any sense when you try to bring them together. Uh, because part of what it is is that the only way they can make sense is if they're brought together in a religious discourse. You know, and I've written about that in a few places. So we have to develop an alternative religious discourse in which those things don't make any sense together. You know, a prime example um, that I used in an article um, that I wrote a number of years back is there was a group that, uh, began trying to uh, defang, as it were, the Confederate flag. And so what they did was they began marketing a Confederate flag in the colors of red, black, and green, right, the colors of the black liberation uh, flag. Well, it didn't go over well. In fact, it didn't gain any traction at all because you had two things that could not share the same conceptual space. And so as a consequence, they literally made no sense at all. So it had no symbolic power. 
So part of what we have to do is uh, work on the articulation of the faith in which these two things that I've described earlier have no symbolic power because you can't make sense of them when you bring them together. You, you, you shared about uh, kind of focusing on uh, the testimony of the saints as uh, as opposed to this kind of abstract experience and or generic human reason. Um, and, and, and I wonder if there's not something to be gained by just recognizing how certain saints say like the life of MLK in the middle of this, how Martin Luther King Jr. got turned into something conservatives point at and say content of their character, therefore colorblindness. And let's not acknowledge the fact that when colorblind racism gets connected to uh, e- resentment for the government and uh, and cultural things that that's not like Jim Crow remorphed, right? But what, like, I can start to notice things like that, but I, what is the theological r- response to maybe an observation like that to reclaim the saint and try to introduce uh, that saint in a prophetic way? Because so often I think um, his bust is sitting in Trump's office. And right. it should be scaring him like uh, Marley coming back to holler at Scrooge. Right, right. Well, actually, he probably gets a good laugh every time he walks into his office. That's why he keeps it there. Uh, but, you know, I think that one of the ways that I think about um, uh, sort of uh, the witness of the saints is being attentive to the witness, not of those necessarily who have been beatified by history, but rather being attentive to the witness of those who are struggling to try and find life, right? And this is where I think, um, uh, um, you know, our hermeneutical posture, our way of interpreting not only our context, but scripture as well, is that by being attentive to the witness of those with whom Jesus hung out with, Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, one of the things that I tell my class is that if you showed up uh, in Jesus's time, you showed up in his general vicinity and, you you know, and you were looking for him and it wasn't dinner time because he, you know, he he, he enjoyed a good meal. So he would eat with a centurion every now and then for people with money. But if it wasn't dinner time, he was spending all of his time with those who are the last and the most hurt. So as a consequence, then listening to the voices and their voices becomes critically important, right? I mean, you know, one of the great tragedies, and here I'm going to shift a little bit, um, uh, and, and this will probably be the only overtly political thing that I'll say, um, but one of the great tragedies for me of this past election were the number of people who were saying, particularly for, you know, to the progressive movement, we need your help, right? Don't put your principles ahead of us, right? So we need for you to ensure that this man does not get elected so our families don't get deported. We need for you to ensure that this man does not get elected so that our right to marriage doesn't get taken away from us. We need for you to vote for this man so that the crumbs that we get in terms of a monthly check and maybe SNAP doesn't get taken away from us, that so many people were so committed to arguing against neoliberalism that they you sort of see what I'm getting at? So when I talk about the witness of the saints, I'm talking about the material well-being of those who are most vulnerable in our midst. And that that then becomes a part of the hermeneutical principle by which we interpret the faith. So if the way that we are articulating the faith, they end up in a worse condition than they were when we started articulating the faith, then we've actually done something wrong. And the only way we'll know what place they're in is by actually listening to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think that uh, there is a lot to learn um, out of this experience for uh, for the church and for theologians. And I know that 
I, I mean, I wish this wasn't the situation, but I know that there are going to be classes of ministers uh, taking theology and reading and reading the book, and it's more timely than anticipated. And I just, I just hope that uh, we take an opportunity as leaders of the church to stay awake to the moment um, mm-hmm. and not use the, uh, the situation as a time to retreat. No, that's exactly right. I mean, we are called now as never before. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, the call of history is upon us, and, it's, and we have to answer that call. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk today and uh, for all the work. I'm sure it went into uh, uh, editing a book with this many different theologians involved. Um, but I know uh, there are going to be plenty of students for years that are going to benefit from it. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. And I really hope um, um, that this book uh, really helps people find some language for what I know is in the depths of their heart about wanting to make a better world. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Tripp. Take care.